This system will. Well, when a day is Thursday, January 17, 2019. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, and I'll have quite a bit to say about that. We're going to focus mostly on the live charts this week when we get to that. So just hang on a little while. We'll get to it. I do want to cover a few things, and we'll just get to that in a second or two. So what's our focus? Well, today I'm going to talk about embracing our cognitive biases and could that be the holy grail and i'm a big fan of studying trading psychology as you know and in more recent times or at least over the last five or so years i've become more engrossed in trading psychology because if you can get your psychology right then that's that is the secret to trading most people are set up junkies Last few weeks, I mentioned the TFM 10% system, for lack of a better name, and my inbox fills up with people asking me about the rules and wanting the indicators and everything else. And everybody gets really excited. When I talk about trading psychology, I'm lucky to get one or two emails on it. But the reality is the mechanics of trading are fairly easy. It takes a little experience, but one thing that amazes me is how easy – the mechanics really are. Now, applying those mechanics is not. And one of our biggest problems is a cognitive bias. And I didn't realize how big that problem can be or how many different sects that goes into, but there's a lot of them when it comes to a cognitive bias. And that'll make sense in just one minute. And once again, I want to do a bear market update. I want to keep that question mark in there for now. I want to be really careful to not label myself and I'm kind of thinking on the fly here if I did label myself then that would create a cognitive bias a cognitive bias in and of itself wouldn't it there's a disclaimer screen as you know you can lose money trading or as often summing up all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then in case I forget I think everybody here has taken it but if you haven't taken it yeah take the market timing course which will be either under the members area just sign up for a free membership and you'll get the market timing course. Or if you see the banner ad on my website, just put your information in there. And you're going to get the, an introductory course, which will give you, a, I hate to say a crash course, but it'll give you an introduction to my methodology. And then right now, I think it's real timely. That's why I made that market timing course free. And I forget exactly when I went public with that. It's, it's part of it, or I should say this is a subset that's under the members area. I published the members area part a long time ago, long before the market triggered the sell signal. And I forget exactly when I published it for free. And anyway, the point is that a lot of those signals have triggered since then. The market has sold off fairly hard. Not that this will always happen, but it makes me feel good in that I've given this information out and people were able to use it to their advantage. So I don't think it's too late to learn a little market timing, even though the slide some people could argue the bomb's already blown up, but who knows? We could still have some further downside. And when we get to the live charts, we'll definitely flesh that out. In the January 16th, 2019 Q&A, I was continu continuing my conversation on system development and more specifically system development while actively trading it. As I said Recently, it's like building the airplane while you're flying it, which is okay for a members area where we're adding new content as we continue to go and fixing some bugs along the way where 90% of it is roughed out and up and running or 95% and we're just making it better with time. That's one thing, but trading a methodology on the fly or building that methodology on the fly can be really, really dangerous. And one thing that that got me thinking about was cognitive biases. And I had forgotten about this graphic. I was just thinking more along the lines of perceptual distortion, selective perception, and things along those lines. But there's a lot more to cognitive biases as this graphic illustrates. And I don't know if you can read the bottom of it. 
but it is from designhacks.co and I do plan on getting this poster for my new office and I think it's very important. There's a lot of things in here that make a lot of sense like sunk costs, fallacy, I don't know if you can read on your screen, but things like sunk costs would be, well, you've already put so much money into this trade, let me just hang on even though it's going past my stop with the hopes that it comes back. So a lot of behavioral finance in here, a lot of behavioral science in here. And I think just any one of these could be many presentations that of themselves. For instance, I'm just kind of randomly picking a few. Dunning-Kruger effect is something that we talked about a few weeks ago. So you have to be really careful of your cognitive biases. Now, the, we'll, we're going to look at the actual definition in one second, but just – my way of wrapping my head around a cognitive bias would be if you have a certain political affiliation, as we all seem to do, as we all seem to be passionate about nowadays. And I never talk politically. And the reason I don't do that is I don't want to run off half of my clients. And I probably, to a fault, try to keep down my affiliation to where I've talked with clients personally and they're surprised to find out that I'm not on the certain side just because of the way I present myself. So I've got to be careful not to let my bias come out. But the point is, if you're watching TV and somebody comes on and they have the little D or the little R next to their name, Democrat or Republican, and you're of the opposite party, it seems like whatever they say, they just sound like an idiot because that's your, your bias. And it's hard to overcome that bias. And it's kind of funny. I'm just kind of thinking on the fly here. But there's a lot of these things on the Internet where they take something that somebody said in one party and they put somebody else's name on it from another party and people just flat out disagree with it, even though it's from actually from their own party. So that cognitive bias in, in that sense is, is, is a great illustration. What I try to do, and this is one thing I'm thinking about on the fly too, is that if you want to get better at overcoming cognitive biases, then try to overcome cognitive biases in life. Make it part of your life. Try to see the other side. And what I will sometimes do if I go in for lunch and if the news is on or whatever, I try to avoid the news, but I've been a little guilty of watching news in more recent times. Just so many things are unfolding and I can't help myself. I don't watch financial news, but occasionally I will put on the news channel. But what I'll do is I'll put my arm up when somebody comes on and cover up their political affiliation and listen to what they have to say and try to see how I feel about that before I actually see their political affiliation. To make the worse appear the better reason, said Mr. Socrates, and this is from George Selden, who went on to say, the Socratic method applied to the average speculator would produce amazing results. Well, if you approach things from a Socratic method, you're kind of looking at things from the opposite opinion of your own. As I've said before, in reading one of these trading psychology books, one of the things the author suggested was to take a personality test. So I took a personality test. I got a zero in agreeableness which told my kids, told my wife, they were like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, why are you wasting my time? Because that's how I am. I tend to beat the dead horse in life. I beat the dead horse in the markets because I think that I'm right. And obviously no one else is. So that's a huge hindrance when it comes to trading. Now I know why I get so angry when the market is not moving in my favor, not doing as I think it should. So you have to realize just because you started trading 
doesn't mean that you no longer have a pulse. And as I often say, your personal life will creep into your trading and your trading life will creep into your personal life. If you are of a certain stature in your life, meaning that you're not very agreeable, then that agreeableness is not going to, or lack of agreeableness is not going to work well in the markets. So embracing who you are is very important. And as hard as it is, if you could be a little bit more Socratic, like Mr. Selden explains, then that'll really help you to see the other side of the trade. What is the other guy thinking? Okay, what does he know that I don't know? Why does he have an opinion which is just the opposite of mine? Now, before we get much further, let's go ahead and look at a definition of cognitive biases. A cognitive bias is a mistaken reasoning, evaluating, remembering, or other cognitive process often occurring as a result of holding on to one's preference and beliefs regardless of contrary information. Well, as you'll see in a few minutes, it's very hard to be an unbiased participant once you get into a market, okay? So it's one thing to have an opinion about the market, and it's one thing to be an analyst. And nothing wrong with analysts, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being a technician. But when you actually trade, it becomes much more difficult. It's much more difficult once you have skin in the game. As I often say, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. So it's very easy to hold a belief until proven wrong if you're not an active participant. And it was Tyson or Tyson's trainer, I think more accurately, once said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And that's what happens. You're not an unbiased participant. Now, few persons are so introspective as to be able to tell where this bias in favor of their own interest begins and where it leads off. And even fewer, according to Mr. Selden, bother to make the effort to tell. I forget which year this book was published, but it's the psychology of the stock market. I think I have a paper copy around here somewhere. It is in public domain, so you can get it off of Google Docs. It's a quick read. It's a very good book. Anyway, he went on to say that optimism then must consist in believing not that the tide will continually flow your way, but that, that you will succeed in floating with the tide. Your optimism must be in a sense, of the intellect, not of the will. Let me repeat that. Your optimism must be, in a sense, of the intellect, not of the will. An optimism based on determination would, in this case, amount to stubbornness. So again, we have someone like me who's a 0% in agreeableness. He's going to be pretty stubborn when it comes to markets. I have to force myself to do things. I have to force myself to place a stop sometimes because I know I'm going to project my feelings, my hopes onto the market. We all do. Now, if you think about a lot of these cognitive biases, it all sort of boils down to perception. And if you can get your perception right, then you're going to be fine. And I like the second form of this definition. I think this is from Google definitions. To interpret or look on something or some, someone or something in a particular way. So with a confirmational bias, it's our perception of what is isn't always what is. So there's two main things which I originally thought about were the genesis of this presentation was that the two main things when it comes to a confirmational bias is our selective perception. We tend to agree with information that agrees with information that supports our position. So if you're along a market and it's going down, going down, going down, going down, and you're thinking, oh, it's oversold, and then all of a sudden it begins to pop up a little bit, all of a sudden you're like, aha, see, I'm right, it's going up. Well, never mind the fact that it's been dropping for days and you're just seeing a little bit of intraday tick up. And then a very related concept here would be perceptual distortion. In other words, some sort of false justification. In my confession time in the aforementioned Q&A, I admitted that I almost plotted an oscillator 
in a market that I'm long that's very, very oversold and due to bounce. I almost quantified just how oversold that market was. I haven't plotted an oscillator in 15 years, probably, maybe longer. But I found myself wanting to sort of create some sort of information that agreed with me, okay? Letting that cognitive bias, that confirmation bias creep in, and I had to be aware of what I'm doing. I had to stop myself. By the way, one one thing you can do, and I talk with work with some individuals one on one back when we were at St. Lucia at Charlie Kirk's retreat. He had a very high level of trader that showed up for this retreat, and I was very humbled from the people there. Some of the younger guys who were a little less experienced. One of the things I talk to them about when holding yourself accountable is explain, even if there's nobody around, explain what you're doing as if you were teaching someone in your office. And you'll realize how stupid you will sound when you're doing that, when you know you're not doing the right thing. So if I would have got around to plotting an oscillator, it's like, oh, well, I'm plotting this oscillator to show how oversold the market is and how I'm still right. Market's just oversold. It should come back. So you realize how stupid you sound when you do that. So if there's no one else around, then do that. If you are blessed where you could find a trading partner, and that's one of the things my longer term goal is to create a mastermind group where we can help each other out. But shorter term, through the Facebook group, if a couple of you guys can get together and help each other out, that would be fantastic. I'm not going to be around forever, obviously. And I think it'd be great if you guys could begin to work together. Over the years, even with without having a, a group like that, I was able to hook a few people people up. And this is especially true with women because women have a hard time finding other women in the trading world. And I think it's important for women who behave and act in a certain way to partner with other women who behave and act in a certain way, just so they can know each other and understand how the emotions and feelings are in the markets. And on the same, on the flip side, I think it's important for men to be with other men and men are tend to be a little bit egotistical. And if you have two guys that are trading a very similar methodology, one can call the other one out when he's being a little egotistical. Women, as a general statement, tend to be a little more emotional, but I'm, I scored very high in emotional uh, <laughs> on my personality test. I cry like a schoolgirl when I'm forced to watch a Nicholas Sparks novel. So I have a bit of that bad trait there too. But women being more emotional, that's not necessarily a bad thing when it comes to trading, believe it or not. There was some hedge fund guy says, oh, women can't trade. Well, I, I take the opposite side of that argument. I think that their egos are much smaller when it comes to trading, and they actually use those emotions to their advantage to do the right thing and be a little bit more protective of their capital. I've been doing this a very long time, and I only know, I've only known a one woman trader who blew up and that's just kind of an interesting aspect i think the women percentage wise now percentage wise is much fewer women so i don't know if i have a representative sample but from what i've seen the women tend to do better than the men now my research into all this is empirical but i don't know if it was montier or someone else but one of these behavior science book guys or behavioral finance book guys did an experiment where the husbands who got their wives involved in their trading, their trading actually got better. But the wives who got their husbands involved in their trading, their trading actually got worse. And I think that reaffirms the ego versus emotional problem when it comes to trading. Now, getting back to the cognitive biases, you have to separate yourself from the market. I know, easier said than done. If you are long or short of the market, you are not an unprejudiced judge, and you will be greatly tempted to put such an interpretation upon current events as will coincide with your preconceived opinion. So what is that once again? You're looking for that selective perception 
or possibly you can misinterpret the information or, or even perceptually distort that information to coincide with your pre preconceived opinion. The more I read this quote, the more powerful it becomes for me. We are not perceiving the market, but only the unique market in our minds. And that's that's really interesting. And I, again, I've got some positions going against me that's kind of frustrating me and all. And I really need to think about that. What I am perceiving is not necessarily the real market. I'm perceiving what I want to happen in the market. And I think we're all guilty of that. And that's why, going back a few slides, Mr. Selden said the Socratic method, he who applies that Socratic method would do really well. So the market that we're perceiving, provided that we're actually a participant in that market, we actually have some skin in the game, is a total different market, quite possibly, than what really is. So we are not perceiving the market, but only the unique market in our minds based on the distinctions we have learned up until this moment in time. The market has no control over how you behave or respond to it. It's all in your head. So again, the more I read this quote, the deeper and deeper it becomes. But what we perceive is our perception of the market, and that perception is going to be altered, provided, of course, we have skin in the game. I would never throw anyone under the bus, but as I've been saying quite recently, every time we get a little swing low in the market, they rush out and call a bottom. Well, they were wrong, they were wrong, they were wrong, they were wrong, and maybe this time they're right. They predict it again. Well, obviously these people have no skin in the game because you cannot go in and make all those predictions and actually put money on the line and be so damn wrong in such a big way until you finally are right. It doesn't work that way. That's not how, that's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. Beatrice. So as I beat the dead horse, don't confuse the issue with facts unless you're Bill Clinton. What is, is. The market is doing what the market is doing. It's not doing what you want it to do. Well, sometimes it does, but more often than not, it won't be. What the market is doing is what the market is doing. The price of an instrument, the ask, is the lowest amount that someone will sell it to you, period. I've seen people recently talk about, well, I want to use fundamentals as a backstop for my trades. So if I get into a trade... It's a company I'd want to own anyway. Well, I think that's a very bad justification because it, spelled with silent S-H, happens. The CEO might do something stupid. There might be a competitor that you don't know of that's doing things much better. The company could have problems. So there's a host of things that could happen that you are not aware of. Also, and I don't want to go off too far and saying the F word, the fundamental word, but one of the arguments that somebody mentioned once that made a lot of sense was you have institutions with millions and millions and possibly even billions of dollars to do all this fundamental research, but percentage-wise, they all tend to under, underperform. So if there was some sort of fundamental research that you could do that would predict stock prices, then obviously you would own the world. But Dave, what about technical analysis? You know, would you say that the same thing? Well, not exactly because technical analysis is more of what is, is. It's either going up, it's going down or sideways, but there's no guarantee, obviously, that it's going to keep doing what it is. But if you pick your spots carefully, longer term, you should be able to get on those trends. And by the way, as I preach also, the only way to profit from a market is to capture a trend. Now, getting back to what is, is the value of an instrument, the bid, is the lowest amount that someone will pay you for it. So what's a stock worth? It's worth what the bid of the stock is. There's a whole bunch of those behavioral finance things, and one of them that I think that was listed in a cognitive bias was the endowment effect. So once you own something, it tends to go up in value in your own mind. I am in the process of downsizing 
and I'm going to have to get rid of a lot of my crap. And I think my crap is worth a lot more than it really is. It's only worth what someone is willing to pay me, regardless of how long I've held on to it. It's only worth what someone's willing to pay me. So again, what is, is. Now, you might not like it, and chances are statistically you won't, because markets do tend to go against you quite a bit. But what is, is. One of the greatest difficulties encountered by the active trader is that of keeping his mind in a balanced and unprejudiced condition when he is heavily committed to either long or short side of the market. Unconsciously to himself, he permits his judgment to be swayed by his hopes. Well, <laughs> I think it's, it's pretty blatant right there. We're going to have a bias. Now, I don't know if sophistry is an old time word, but a lot of the research and quotes are obviously coming from the psychology of the stock market from George Selden. And this was a word he used that I wasn't familiar with. Sophistry. I haven't ever heard it in my life. You know, so I don't know if it's an old time word or not. So I looked it up and it's the use of fallacious arguments, especially with the intent of deceiving. And I think we're guilty of using the sophistries against ourselves, if I use that correctly in the sentence. So we really cannot be budged by our sophistries. And again, getting back to Mr. Selden, a lot of good information in that little book. The market is relentless. It cannot be budged by our own sophistries. It will respond exactly to the forces and personalities which are working upon it with no more regard for our opinions than if we couldn't vote. We cannot work for our own interests as in other lines of business. And that's a big thing I often talk about, okay? In other businesses, you can, you can push something on one end and something comes out the other, quoting Steve Jobs. But in trading, you really can't force your will upon the market. We can only fit our interests to the facts. To make the greatest success, it is necessary for the trader to forget entirely his own position in the market. I know, easier said than done. His profits or losses, the relation of present prices to the point where he bought or sold. That's the sunk cost fallacy and a little bit of the endowment effect too. And to fix his thoughts upon the position of the market. If the market is going down, the trader must sell no matter whether he has a profit or a loss, whether he bought a year ago or two minutes ago. So obviously your stop is going to have to be outside the normal volatility, and that's not what he's talking about. But he's saying if it's going down past your risk parameters, which if you get your risk parameters properly and you your stock selection is really good or other market selection is really good, then you shouldn't get stopped out too often. You're going to get stopped out more often than you want to. But it shouldn't be too often. In the longer term, you should be able to capture enough trends to make it all worthwhile. But you have to stay fixated on the fact that what is, is. And I think that this is a very eloquent way of saying what is, is, and separate yourself out. He can endeavor to hold himself in a detached, unprejudiced frame of mind and try to study psychology of the crowd, especially as it manifests itself within price movements. So what is the crowd? doing? Is there a supply? Is there demand? Or is there equilibrium? Is the big blue arrow pointing up? Is the big blue arrow pointing down? Is the big blue arrow pointing sideways? Roy Longstreet from Viewpoints of a Commodity Trader. I actually gave my book away. <laughs> Charlie Kirk said, bring a favorite book down. And I brought it down with me. He's like, it's my favorite book. And uh, so yeah, I tell you what, you could have it. I'll just give it away, whatever. And it'll be one less thing I got to fly back with. And I'll just get another copy when I get home. And then I looked it up on the internet. It's like, it's a rare book. <laughs> so anyway, I digress. But it's a good little book. Uh, see if you could find a, maybe a reprint or something on the internet. It's called Viewpoints of a Commodity Trader. If you go to my website, I have it linked to my Amazon account where you can look it up there. And that's under DaveLeonard.com slash books dash two dash read. Anyway, Mr. Longstreet said the deeper secret for the trader is his ability to subordinate his own will to the will of the market. 
I wish I would have listened to Mr. Longstreet many, many years ago. And I wish I'd have taken that personality test many, many years ago. I have a bad habit of subordinating my own will. <laughs> my strong personal convic convictions because I have a 0% in agreeableness. So that is hard. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm going to give you a few things in one minute to think about, but it's not easy. Now, Annie Duke's book, Thinking in Bets, I got a lot out of this book. My only disappointment was she got me really, really excited like she was going to solve this problem of our outcome bias and following the process and all. And, and she, she kind of went in that direction. And one of her things was find someone else to partner with, which I thought was good, but she didn't fully solve the problem. But she certainly got me thinking a lot about outcome biases and the importance of outcome biases and understanding the process is much more important than the outcome. Anyway, she said, instead of altering our beliefs to fit the new information, we do just the opposite, alternate our interpretation of that information to fit our beliefs. So I think she's talking about the perceptual distortion. So you're along a particular market and it goes down a little further. Well, instead of in your mind saying, well, that market's going against me, I need to let that stop get hit and take me out. You might be thinking, well, it's oversold now. And, and then you might even take it one step further, further to figure out when has it been this oversold before? And should I continue to hold on even past my stop because it's so oversold? More on what is, is. And I didn't realize how much I quoted Mrs. Selden when I was working on this original presentation, which was a presentation simply on perception, but I really did. For we all realize that the prices of stocks must, in the long run, be controlled by public opinion. The point we fail to remember is the public opinion is in a speculative market is measured in dollars, not in population. Well, so those who have skin in the game are controlling what happens. Getting back to just technical analysis 101, when we get to the live charts, I'm going to talk about the overhead supply. And there's nothing magical about that. We know that people have likely either bought or have at least held onto their stocks during that base. And when the market gets back to that base, they're likely to sell those stocks. So if you were to buy stocks right now, as a general statement, you have an uphill battle against you. One, because the long-term downtrend is still intact, and that psychologically has an impact on the participant, participants. And two, you're bumping into that overhead supply. So forget about all the complex things that sometimes comes with technical analysis and look at what is. Is is the market going up? Is it going down? Is it going sideways? Is there overhead supply, obvious overhead supply, or obvious support below? If you're shorting, where would that market likely stop doing whatever it's doing? And again, what is, is. Now, whenever I talk about trading psychology, I realize that I tend to point out a lot of problems. And I realize that you are going to need solutions for those problems. So how do we overcome these cognitive biases? Well, one thing is to make the trade bigger than you. When, again, not the last week at band camp, but last month in St. Lucia, there were a couple of the people who were have accomplished a lot, a lot through their lives getting a little bit older. And one of their goals was to leave some sort of legacy for their children. So my point was, when they were having some difficulties in trading, was to make the next trade and every trade thereafter bigger than you. Are you moving toward your goal with this trade or are you moving away from your goal with this trade? If you're a position trader and you feel the urge to fire off a day trade, is that going to help you move toward your longer term goal or away from it? Are you taking away from your children's legacy? As I've said before, when I put my process oriented goals up on my website for when I log into my own members area, Every day when I go and check the website or whatever, 
I am forced to look at my goals and I'm forced to reread those goals. And very, they're very process oriented goals. And I'll read them to you in just one second here. Anyway, the point I'm getting there is getting to there is that I just assumed everybody's goals would be process oriented. So when I log in to my website, it says that your trading goals is program or to take only the best opportunities and when there's nothing to do, do nothing. Once I find an opportunity, I will carefully plan that trade and then follow the plan. I resist the urge to micromanage, day trade, or take any unplanned trades with the exception of a money line in the corner s and ogre type trade. So unless I think I have some sort of great opportunity, I am not going to trade. Now, I'm not perfect. I'm human. Those ogres can be wonderful trades, opening gap reversal trades. I talk about them throughout the members area. So just go to methodology to learn about those. But if we come into this particular market, let's say the futures are up huge, 50 points, 60 points, whatever. And we know the market's still in the downtrend. And again, it's January 17, 2019. Then it might be worth playing at opening gap reversal. But I've been sucked into a few day trades here and there thinking that the market is due to reverse. So I'm not holding myself out there as perfect. But when I make that or when I feel the urge to make that next day trade, I need to ask myself, is this moving me toward or away from my goal? What's my longer term goal? Well, to build an empire and... I guess leave a legacy for my family. They're gonna have to be a little nicer to me for me to do that. I'm half kidding. But anyway, these individuals I work with, I said, make the trade bigger than you. And that helps to put you outside of your feelings and emotions and your cognitive biases and do what needs to be done. From a negative aspect, think about how you're taken away from them when you do the wrong thing. So getting back to my goals, which are process oriented, my point there was, when I made the set your trading goals part of the membership area so we could all begin to work together as a team, a lot of the goals turned out to be more motivational oriented and bigger than you type oriented. Like one particular gentleman wanted to grow his account longer term so he would be able to visit his children who live out of the country more often. So in his particular case, when he's firing off that day trade, provided he's not a day trader to begin with, or taking some sort of trade outside of his core methodology, then he's possibly hindering himself from seeing his children more often. Now, I know it's a little deep to think about it like that, but I think it's important to make that trade bigger than you. In the cleanup process, this constant cleanup purging process that we've been doing, you know, lifts aware for 20 years, and I'm borderline a hoarder. <laughs> it's it's very hard for me to throw something away because I feel like I might need that someday. And but anyway, I, we came across a picture of my wife from many years ago, and I put that picture over on my or under my my trading monitor. The, my trading station. And I only did that a few days ago, but now I find myself when I go to make the trade, I'm looking at her and I'm thinking about her future and my family's future and not just my ego and lack of agreeableness when I go to make that trade. And believe me, I am far from perfect. And I think everyone is. And, and I was trying not to when I was putting together this presentation. I came across some other presentations and you, know, you have to realize that these idiots out there that are making it seem super easy, it's just, it's not super easy. It's not as hard as many try to make it, but it's not super easy. But in time, I think you'll do quite well and you'll be surprised, but you're not going to get rich quick. Now, getting back to this cognitive bias thing and overcoming them, again, you want to be Socratic. What could go wrong? And then why does the person on the other side of the trade think that he is right? Some markets, now it's a little bit more complex than stocks because technically it's not necessarily a zero-sum game. 
But in some markets, it is. Like options, for instance, it's a zero-sum game. So when I go to buy an option, I think to myself, why would this person sell me that option at that price? So it's really easy. One of us is going to be wrong, or as the Twitter in chief says, wrong. <laughs> so what does he know that I don't? Why is his opinion diametrically the opposite of mine? And again, be accountable. Now, accountability comes in various forms. The greatest accountability would be to involve your spouse and say, this is what we're doing, blah, 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 and then come home and say, oh, yeah, I fired off some day trades today. I lost my ass. <laughs> so that's hard. And your spouse might not be the best person because it could get a little complicated there. But if you could find someone and maybe through the Facebook group, and eventually through the mastermind group, be able to find somebody that's very like-minded in what you're doing, then your life will get a lot easier. And here's the other thing too, it is so easy to see other people's mistakes and problems and what they're doing wrong. Now, again, I like to use trading as a metaphor for life or life as a metaphor for trading, depends on how you wanna look at it. but Think about family members, friends, and so forth and so forth. How easy is it to see what they're doing that's going to be detrimental to them or that you believe is not in their best interest? And you're probably right. Now, obviously, you can't force your will on them to do what they need to do. That's a whole nother story, but it's very easy from the outside looking in. I as I think it was Jesse Livermore once said, a speculator makes mistakes and he knows that he is making them. I occasionally make mistakes and I know that I'm making them. But when you hold yourself accountable to someone, it's a little bit harder to make those mistakes. So be accountable. And if you don't or can't want to hold yourself accountable to someone else, then like I just said earlier, announce your trades to everyone, even if no one is there. Also, my goal for 2019 is to not only keep a trading journal, but to keep a, keep a detailed emotional journal. And I have a little column in there where, where I call it shame. And I have a confession journal, which I might start using too where I write shame, I'm gonna write shame on the cover of the notebook and write down things that I shouldn't be doing. And being cognizant of your behavior is very important. Mark Douglas had a really good quote, and I wish I could think of it off the top of my head, but if you're feeling kind of conflicted or animosity and stress in your trades, there's always gonna be some stress, don't get me wrong, but if you're really feeling that, conflicted and animosity and you're just all really just wigging out and you're thinking about trades, your trades that you have on outside of market hours to a point of obsessing a little bit, then something's wrong. Something's wrong with your methodology or more importantly, something's wrong with your following of the methodology. A bad methodology followed well will do much better than a good methodology followed poorly. If you could follow a methodology religiously, and even if you're not doing that great with it, then you have proven that you have what it takes to be a trader. Then you just need to go back in and tweak your methodology. And Douglas went on to say that when you are feeling those bad feelings, you have not fully accepted the risk of your behavior. So I'm going to point the finger back to you, or you have to point the finger back at yourself. You're going to have to solve a lot of these problems yourself, but me pointing them out and maybe giving you a few little things to think about. And, and that's where Annie Duke, I was like, oh, great. You know, Annie Duke was like, well, just find somebody to hold you accountable. Okay. Well, that's easier said than done. Well, we're obviously working in that direction with the members area and hopefully we get there. But in the meantime, it's not so easy to find someone to hold you accountable because number one, they would need to know the methodology inside and out. And like in number two, ideally they would need to be trading it also. And then there could be a quid pro quo relationship where you're seeing their problems from 
a very blatant standpoint and vice versa. But again, if you're feeling conflicted, something's wrong, as I often preach, you know what you're doing wrong. All right, I know I kind of went off the psychological deep end here. Any questions, thoughts, amusing anecdotes or anything on that? Anybody want to share any of their confessions, any of their problems when it comes to trading? Okay. I've been kind of beating a dead horse on all the signals lately with the bear market, so I'm just going to touch upon a few little points here. And then we're going to hop into the live chart. So if you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. So I've been talking about winter is coming for quite a while. And I'm quoting that bastard Jon Snow when that comes. By the way, I think Game of Thrones is coming back out soon. I swore I would never watch it. And then uh, I got sucked into it. It's pretty damn good. I've actually gotten some, some good quotes for these presentations out of it. The point that I was making over the last few weeks is, and the only thing I want to cover today, and we'll get into the live charts in one second, is that it's not the signals in and of themselves. It's the magnitude of what can happen next. Now, this chart is of the S&P index. We had a bow tie on a daily chart not too long ago. And the market has dropped significantly from that. And if you go and look at like the Russell 2000, it's dropped about 25% from the daily bow tie. And it doesn't matter what the signal is, as long as it's a trend following signal. If we look at the death cross, or as most people call it, the death cross, in the Russell 2000, and as I said in, previous, in the previous presentation, all of these indices have had significant drops from the death cross so far. So the Russell is down 15.77% from the signal. So on top of the slide that we've had, that's pretty significant. It's not the signal in and of itself, again, not to beat the dead horse, but it's the magnitude of what happens next. So for instance, if we were looking at major and minor signals, major being those coming off of all-time highs or at least 10, 20-year highs, and minor major signals for the buy side coming off of, hopefully, we'd never have to deal with all-time lows. <laughs> so I think we'll be in a lot of trouble if we do. But multi-year lows, like 13-year lows in 2019. By the way, can you imagine 13 years? I remember 2009, 2009 I said 19, 2009, I think, I'm trying to think when Layman's came out, sometime around then, and the market was banging out 13-year lows. Think about that. Let's say you had a toddler and you started putting money in your college account and the market starts hitting 13-year lows. <laughs> You know, that's a long time to not be making new highs in the market. And a lot of people get very confused with the buy and hold. And they confuse the issue with facts. And it's like I'm starting to hear get the panic from friends and relatives now about they're getting their 401k statements in the mail and they open them up and now they're 201ks and they're getting pretty excited about that. But markets do go up and markets do go down. The point I'm making here is, if you take a look at these major cells, and not everyone, and like Greg Moore says, we treat every signal as if it will turn into the big one, Elizabeth implied. But if you go in and look, and I know I've said this ad nauseum, but if you look at the major cell in the S&P 500 on a weekly basis with the bow tie, it did what? Lost about 50% from the year 2000 on. And from early 2008, believe it or not, down to the low, it lost about 50%. And then obviously you had a pretty good run in the major buy that followed. And now, obviously, we have a major sell. So this in and of itself isn't that big of a deal. We have one back here. And as I preach, this sell-off was fairly significant back here. If you're a buy and hold type and you held through that 
Or I should say, if you are a traitor and you held through that, then shame. Because <laughs> that was a pretty ugly movement. I forget what the Russell dropped. I think it was like 18% from the signal. S&P didn't drop that much, but it had a significant sell-off nonetheless. But my concern here now is that we have a major sell signal. And of course, this is a big question mark, but just remember that a market can do whatever it wants, okay? And whenever you have a major sell signal, you need to treat it seriously. And if you get really bored, go in and watch all the weekend charts for the past several months, excuse me, where I talk a lot about the market timing. And barring a line from my friend Greg Morris, just don't operate heavy machinery after viewing. Now, the other thing recently we were talking about, we had this TFM system that I developed recently. Just real quick, what I occasionally will do, you know, my new modus operandi is to figure out how simple I can make something. And I forget what Occam's razor says, but it's along the lines of, keeping things simple. And as a, for instance, Snapchat was coming out. I know I've told this several times, but if you go in the members area, I actually show the, the little setup that I came up with there was I wanted to say, okay, a lot of these IPOs, especially those are well hyped, tend to come public really high and then they die. So what's, type of little system or setup could I create that would stop people from buying something stupid like Snapchat and then subsequently a few months later was deja vu all over again with Blue Apron and I said well what if you just wait for the low to be greater than the five period simple moving average which wouldn't allow you to trade until day six and it had to close at a new high and that's pretty much the whole Setup. There's a few caveats in there. The opening range, the high of the day, the close must also be above the high of day one. But it's all spelled out for you in the IPO course. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is I like to figure out something really, really simple so I could write it on a cocktail napkin and explain it to a kid and they could actually follow it. And it would keep them out of a lot of trouble. So along that lines of reasoning is like, okay, markets start to look a little iffy in here. What type of simple system could I create? And I got to thinking about the ABCs of technical analysis. If markets going from A to C and B's in between, it's got to pass through B, right? So if a market's going to drop 50% like it did back in 2000 and like it did back in 2008, it's going to have to do what first? Drop 10%, okay? So once a market drops 10% from its previous closing high, and in this case, it's on a weekly chart. So I'm using, I think I'm using a 50-week moving high in here. You don't have to split hairs too much. You get the idea. You don't have to be precisely accurate in it, but the 10% seems to be a pretty good number for the indices. Then you need to think about getting out of the market's way. So we just had a sell signal recently based on this system. And it's the magnitude of what happens next. I'm not bragging like, oh, this is the greatest system ever or anything. It's just something to help keep you on the right side of the market. If you're using a weekly bow tie, or even let's say a 50 week moving average on a 50 on a weekly chart and you're looking at the Landry light meaning that the highs are below that moving average you generally as a general statement you want to be short if the highs are greater than that moving average as a general statement you want to be long so go through the free courses under the members area where I talk about the Landry light. So again, on the long side, if the lows are greater than the moving average, as a general statement, you wanna be long. On the short side, if the highs are less than the moving average, you wanna be short. So that silly little 
way of following trend actually works pretty darn good. All right. Last thing, again, if you haven't already taken it, take the market timing course, and you'll be up to speed on all this, and you'll know just as much about me afterwards about market timing. I'm just going to spend a few minutes here talking about what's happening, and then we'll open it up for individual questions. Now, confession time, I've really been having to – a little bit of, of, of remind myself what is is when it comes to markets because I think that the market, well, I know it's in a downtrend, but I'm just surprised that it's not continue, continuing to go down. It's defying gravity. So I have to remember what is is, and for my short positions, I have to be willing to get out of the way. I'm not good when it comes to agreeableness. All right, let's start with the P's. Let me get that. All right, here we have the S&P 500. It's a little easier to see if you back the chart way out. So let's do that. If you back the chart way out, it sure looks like a major, major, major top. You had a big slide, and now it's just retracing that slide. Now, I'm kind of wondering is if as long as it continues higher, Will buying beget more buying? I was last weekend, uh, somebody was freaking out a little bit about the markets. And I said, look, this is this is what you might want to think about doing. And I drew the little I drew the little chart on the market. And I said, OK, the market and pretty much mirrors what's what's here. So the market sold off. It looks something like this. The market sold off, did like this, and now it's dropped, and now it's back up. So what I said, and I, I try not to get it too much into overhead supply, but it, my strong feeling is that the market's going to have a hard time getting through this overhead supply. So what I told them was, if it goes down and makes new lows, then something's wrong. You might want to get out of the way. Now, I was a little hesitant to tell him that because what happens if this is the low? I talked with a friend a few weeks back, and he was really stressed out about the markets. And I said, look, we could be on the cusp of something really big here. You might want to think about your future. And he actually bailed out the next day. Now, I hate to be responsible for anyone but if you wrap your head around the fact that the market could lose 50% of its value, and it's done so twice over the past two decades, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. I can't believe what short memories people have when it comes to markets. But what's your opportunity cost? Or what's the, I don't know if that's the right word or not, but what is your... What is the danger? OK, I guess the danger would be fear of missing out if it continues higher. But if you're near retirement, you need to think, do you really want to retire with half the money that you have? And if you have $10 million for retirement, then $5 million, you're probably going to be OK. But if you have $1 million for retirement and you lose half of that, then your lifestyle is going to be a little bit different. So it's something to think about. You need to think about what can happen and not the fear of missing out. And I hope, and you should never use the word hope, but I hope that this is the quote unquote bottom in the markets. But so far, I have not been proven otherwise. Now, this is not to say that the markets have not improved. Let's get rid of the indices real quick or get through the indices and then we'll take a look at everything else. So take a look at the NASDAQ. Let's back the chart out a little bit. And since we have a little time, let's do this. Let's take a look at the, the weekly bow ties here. So it's a little sloppy, but we do have the weekly bow tie crossing. Let's go back to the S&P 500. Same sort of action there too, okay? So these are major longer-term signals in the works. And the Russell 2000, which is kind of fascinating it actually triggered a weekly bow tie way up here. So what's the low on that? So that low gets taken out at 147, and then it went all the way down to 125. 
So that's a pretty serious drop from that weekly bow tie. So getting back to the NASDAQ, yes, things have improved as of late, but now we're beginning to push into this overhead supply. I think it's going to have a hard time getting through it, but so far, the market doesn't care what I think. Russell 2000, it's not really pushed too much into this overhead supply. It depends on how you measure it. But same sort of action as the other indices. When you back the chart out, it looks pretty ugly. And if you look at a much, 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 much longer term chart, this could be the start of something much bigger. Now, after showing you that I'm still bearish, this market's due to sell off, sell off. It's, at, it's at high levels due to roll lower, downtrend, pullback, etc. Let's look at the flip side, okay? Let's be a little Socratic with this, right? Well, some areas like financials have been improving as of late. And you can see these are pushing, these guys are pushing into their overhead supply. The banks have been doing really well as of late, and they've pushed way higher. It still sort of looks like a retrace to me, but what it is is so far they're pushing higher, okay? At some point, I might need to be a little careful in my kind of bearish bias that I tend to have. Most of these sectors still look like they could be in trouble, even though they've had these serious retraces as you go through these MIGs or whatever, you know, pick your favorite sectors that you want to use. But again, most, with a few exceptions, like real estate's trying to get back to its old highs in here, okay? Drugs have had a pretty serious recovery in here. And I was in a presentation a couple days ago for Timing Research, and I believe it was Neil Batho or somebody in the group pointed out that the worst thing can happen was if this market makes it back to new highs, near new highs, and begins to roll over again, then you could see the mother of all rollovers. Now, that's a little bit longer term thinking, but I'd be really careful and just pick your spots carefully. Even if we did start pushing past this overhead supply in here, we got back above 2,800. But so far, this market is retracing. It's either going to be the mother of all retracements or, I'm sorry, it's either going to be the mother of all reversals or it's going to be a big fat rollover. And the market will do, and this is something I got from Linda Rasky, and she said she probably got it off the floor when I asked her, but the market will do what it has to do to cause the most amount of pain to the most amount of people. And a corollary is it will always do, or often, I should say, do the obvious thing in the most unobvious manner. So what does that mean? Well, I think this market's going to roll over because it's pretty damn obvious that it looks like it's getting ready to roll over. But what is it going to do first? Well, it's going to push into this overhead supply like it's the all clear. And then what's going to happen? Then it's going to roll over. Now, I don't know that for a fact, but that would certainly be plausible. And something that could actually happen. All right. Any questions on the overall market? Any sectors you want me to look at before we start looking at individual stocks? I know people like to look at gold and silver. Gold looks pretty good shorter term, but longer term, not so much. Okay. Gold's pushing into this overhead supply and it's kind of all over the place. As I preach, when it comes to something like gold, let's take a look at like a weekly chart. I much rather look to buy gold somewhere around a transition, not that I'm catching a low, but I like for it to hit a multi-year low, a major, major low, I should say, years and years and years, and then look to trade it, the bow ties or first thrust, actually wait for it to turn before looking to get in. Okay. All right, let's start looking at some of these individual stocks. Q, L, I, Q, T. The only other thing I wanted to point out after we take a look at this real quick is that I am seeing some improvement in super speculative areas. This might be Exhibit A. Um, this is kind of wild and crazy. Let's see where we are on a weekly chart. Okay. 
On a pullback, I'd say maybe the only problem is if it pulls back from these levels, it would pull back into its prior breakout. So, yeah, I hear you. It's got some momentum to it. The volume looks a little thin. It's only 300 share, 300,000 shares. Is that the average volume? And the because it's a cheap stock, that's, that number is not really that big. So I'd be a little cautious with this one. Maybe if it keeps breaking out, maybe on a pullback, revisit it. So one of the things that I am seeing, and let's see if we can find them. In the IPOs, one thing that I'm seeing, and super speculative issues like the one that Donald just pointed out, I am seeing some bottoming action in these IPOs. You can see that they're starting to bottom out and rally off their lows. They just look a little sold out. And not everyone, but quite a few of them. And there's actually a few that are beginning to set up. So what I'm trying to wrap my head around is, is this the beginning of a new speculative market in IPOs, or is this part of that sinking ship philosophy or analogy, I should say, that I used recently, where the rats are running up the ship as the ship sinks, going to the defensive issues, and looks like that's already happened and done, and then the, the IPOs and super speculative issues are the last gas. But I do, I'm kind of seeing it more as glass half full, the fact that some of these IPOs in here are beginning to bottom out. I think that there's a little money flowing back into the market. It's interesting that it's going after the more speculative issues as it comes back in. But a lot of these, as you can see, nice bottoming action and look like they could be turning the corner and poised to head back up. So that's one little bit of encouragement. Obviously, banks are doing okay. I can't get that excited because banks are doing better. But again, you have to take one piece at a time, and it certainly is a positive piece. All right, any more stocks? Quite a bunch today. SPX and any others, just under 50% retrace of drops and just about at 50 SMA. All right, let's take a look at that. Okay. Just under 50% retrace. Let's see what that is. And I don't know what these numbers are. Let's see. So, and let's see what the 50-day moving average is. And you are correct. Good observation there, Howard. Good eye. Okay, so Howard's saying that we're just about at the 50% retracement. Not a huge fan of Fibonacci, but I eyeball a chart and say, well, this thing is overbought. And you could use other metrics, okay? You could say, well, it's pulled all the way back to the 50. Maybe it'll bounce off of the 50. And if we clean the chart up, you could see we have Landry Light here and Landry Light here. And we still have a little bit of Daylight or Landry Light, whatever we're going to – I don't know what we ultimately would call that, but – the lows, I'm sorry, the highs are greater than the moving average. So as long as the highs are greater than the moving average, or I'm sorry, the highs are less than the moving average, then just by that one metric, the downtrend still remains intact. I know, it's a pretty serious retrace, but we still have it crossed above the 50. Now, anything that's well watched is worth watching. And the 50-day moving average sometimes is... Well, watch, especially when the market sells off. So it's kind of interesting. It's kind of like the old Cajun joke, as I often say. The old Cajun joke is the thermos keeps the hot things hot and the cold things cold. How do it know? Well, one thing I learned early on with technical analysis, I was lucky enough to hook up with some old school guys who really knew this stuff. And one guy explained to me that a lot of technicals usually come together at the same point. So it's kind of like if you're a trend follower, especially, we all sort of end up at the same place, but we might have different ways of getting there, okay? 
So I might be talking about a weekly bow tie, a daily bow tie, et cetera, but somebody else might be using the 50-day moving average or Landry Light or something like that. And a lot of times those technicals, again, will come together. So where is the 50-day moving average? Right there. Where is the overhead supply? Right there, okay? The two correspond, and you'll find that quite often, no matter what you're using, they all tend to come together. So that's kind of an interesting observation. Howard, I'm glad you brought that up. And you're pointing out that the NASDAQ is did make it through. Yeah, it didn't really bust through. But, yeah, for all intents and purposes, or, or actual purposes, I should say, it actually did make it through the 50-day moving average. But now where is it at overhead supply? Okay? Now, a market could do whatever it wants to do. That was kind of my whole little speech, right? It may not do what you want it to do, and it's not right now because I'm still – bearish even though i do have some longs on but whatever it's doing it's doing now we don't have upside daylight or landry light i guess it's now call it in the russell here's something fascinating now it won't always work like this and there's a little hindsight in here but you know i've been preaching the concept of of landry light for a long time notice in this russell 2000 and this entire drop in here on a daily chart using the 50-day moving average, you did not have any daylight to the upside. You still don't have any just yet. So that's kind of an interesting phenomena there. If you want to learn a lot more about the Landry light, again, go in and watch the last several presentations where I really got into the market timing. But this, is, this has got to excite you a little bit that by simply staying short when the prices are below, the highs are below, I should say, the moving average, and generally staying long when it's above the moving average, in general, that will keep you on the right side of the market. Now, you might consider using a little bit longer-term chart, like a weekly, so you're mostly long when it's above and then mostly short when it's below. And this is the first time I've looked at this in a while. It's kind of fascinating. On a weekly basis in the Russell, you could see that <laughs> we're just in the early form of, of Dave Light here, or Landry Light here. But if you go way back in time, you could see bear market, bull market, kind of a little bit of a sell-off here. Pretty serious sell-off here. I think this was 18% if I remember. And then now we're back into sell mode by using this indicator. So Pick your favorite trend following indicator and use it to help you stay on the right side of the market. Just don't use a whole bunch of indicators, okay? Because then you could end up with analysis paralysis, especially if you have those that are inverse of each other, which I covered quite a bit of detail in yesterday's Q&A. So don't want to be too redundant there. I know, maybe you redundant. All right, any other questions? We're almost out of time, but I'll certainly make a little time for any other stock questions or anything. SPX last eight we eight years barely touches, barely two touches of 200 weekly. All right, that's kind of something fun to look at. We got bored in one of the, we're kind of hanging around, and I think we put a 500-day moving average, which I guess would be sort of like your weekly moving average is what you're saying. And let me make sure that I have 200 days in here. So this is, so you're saying a 200 week. Anyway, I think it was Greg Morris and I was sitting around and we were amazed at how the 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 Dave light, a Landry light, and how long it would go. We're going through one by one and how long that, you would be on one side of the market or the other. So you're saying that last eight years, barely two touches of the 200 weekly. I don't see any touches really. I mean, you did have the right here, okay? And that's before this whole thing got started. But it certainly does put some things into perspective. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of lag here because look how long it took the market to get up to that average. So that's a little bit too long term for the timing, but I hear you. And that's kind of interesting in and of itself. But the 50-week moving average, 
it's kind of interesting. And as I've said before, I'm all proud of my bow ties, especially on a weekly basis, keeping on the right side of the market. And then I just happen to have a 50 week moving average plotted. Okay. So just by 50 week, I just need a 50 day moving average and then take a look at the weekly chart. And to my surprise, this silly little 50 week moving average does a pretty damn good job of keeping you on the right side of the market. Okay. You'd be mostly long here, mostly short here, mostly long here, mostly short here, and then mostly long here. A couple of sell signals in between, but for the most part, you'd have done fairly well. So I just find that quite fascinating. Anyway, any more questions, comments? All right, going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for attending. Oh, you're welcome, Howard. Thank you for taking time on your busy schedule. Any unanswered questions, uh, shoot me an email, and I'll either become fodder, fodder for the next Q&A, or I'll cover them in the Q&A sessions in the members area. Everybody have a great weekend. Enjoy your day off in the markets if we don't talk to you now and then. And I hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you very much.